Hey everyone, welcome to another interview. I am very excited to have our guest here today joining us from the States, Angie Hong. Welcome along. Thank you for having me. Very excited to be here. It's great. So for those who don't know, uh, Angie Hong is a board certified music therapist, a pianist, a vocalist, and Mender's band member and songwriter. She's the creative director at Willow Church, where she has special focus on reconciliation in worship and has recently contributed to intercultural ministry, Hope for a Changing World, which is coming out in about a few days now. Very close. Um, so yeah, we're very excited to have you, Angie. And, and since I mentioned a bunch of music-based things, I thought it's just a getting to know you question. Um, what song, what album are you? Uh, what's, what's, what are you living into at the moment? <laughs> That's a great opening question. <laughs> Uh, so, man, right now I'm having this like crazy electro pop moment. I don't okay, know. All right. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's just maybe it's just the season that I'm in. Um, mm. I'm just a lot of electro pop, and um, I mean, yeah, kind of like more on that type. And then a lot of like uh, local. So Chance the Rapper mm -hmm. is from Chicago, and so I, I had a long season where I was listening to him. Yeah. And then uh, Solange's album was really, really good too. So I'm kind of like in that realm right now. Mm -hmm. In terms of worship music, it's so weird because now that I'm not leading worship every week, I, I feel like I've kind of fell out of that <laughs> whole realm, like just staying on top of every trend. So I just yeah. kind of do whatever our church ends up doing, which is a mix of like old, uh, old and new, but mostly like a little, a few years older kind mm -hmm. of like yeah cool yeah. all right well it gives everyone some things to check out or you know you want to like uh you know like something to complement the learning we're going to do you know you can listen to an answer then play some electro pop and then come back to the next answer you know how, make it your own <laughs> <Will do. laughs> yeah. uh, all right well as we mentioned before you've contributed a chapter to intercultural ministry hope for a changing world which is edited by uh, jan aldridge clanton and grace ji sung kim who people will know we've had on a couple of times now and, and in the most oh, recent cool. interview. yeah and in the most recent recent interview we talked about the book and it sounds really exciting uh so what's the focus of your chapter and what was it like to contribute to such a project yeah well, I wasn't planning on uh, doing this and she kind of brought me on without us even having met each other. And since then, we've actually become really good friends and I just saw her yesterday, actually. She oh, right. today, so we got to hang out and whenever we get together, we act like teenagers. We're just like, oh my gosh. Oh. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, this book on intercultural ministry, um, my chapter specifically is about how when we're all included at the table how do we make sure that each voice is heard like what are the practices and disciplines that churches need to do in order for us to truly be present at the table and not just kind of there mm -hmm. um so what does it mean to be fully present and valued and honored yeah, yeah. Great, yeah. Oh, I'm very excited to hear about that. And I'm, I'm, I pre-ordered my book a while ago, so I'm, I'm excited for when it arrives. So <laughs> it should be good. Uh, and everyone else should too. Uh, so uh, staying with the book and thinking about the title, uh, if I were to kind of riff off Peter for a second and ask you for an account for the hope that is within you, um, where or how do you see intercultural ministry as hope for a changing world? I think we're in a very interesting time in our uh, in our history and even what's going on in the church. I think a lot of um, groups, a lot of faith groups, like a lot of nonprofits, conferences, and um, and a lot of like Christian worlds are desiring sort of this diversity, and they're really unsure about the steps, the next steps to get there mm -hmm. to um, to a place where they have true diversity and inclusion. And so um, right now, I, I feel like there's this influx of really, really wanting it and really wanting to know how to like best do it. And um, so my hope is that is for the the church the global church to really step into what what that means and what are the best practices like how can we really honor each other 
in, in this. Um, and I know there's going to be a lot of failings along the way, but I think overall, I'm really hopeful that people are really starting to listen and they're starting to understand things like race, ethnicity, um, power dynamics, system structures, implicit bias. And as, and as that becomes more mainstream um, and a part of our discipleship process, I think, um, you know, sky's the limit on where we can go with that. Also, the world is changing and becoming more diverse, so it's going to happen anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of like, what do we do about it? So I'm really, really hopeful. I think it's a really good time. Great. Yeah, that sounds really exciting. I think that's the, obviously is the direction we need to go and, and, and understand that it could be, it's going to be tough and it's going to be failings, but uh, it's failing in the right direction kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so there's been some talk about the difference between like a multicultural church or multicultural ministry and intercultural. Uh, do you recognize a difference between the two terms and how they are practiced? Uh, and if so, could you yeah, elaborate the importance of intercultural like specifically in our ministry? Yeah. Um, so I thought about this a lot too, because I, I, I do focus a lot on this multicultural um, I actually stay away from that word. Uh, mm -hmm. I do more multi-ethnic. I kind of like go on that. But there are a lot of communities, especially here in the States, that are very monocultural. Um, there are a lot of places where you're never, I mean, where it's going to be really hard to find somebody of a different culture um, within that community. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's as like a I don't think it's as secluded as we think, but um, where it begins with the intercultural ministry is that you can have a church that's mono-ethnic and it'd be very, very diverse. You can have um, people that were kind of like a, a part of another de denomination. You can have people that are a part of another uh, political party. You can have um, people that, you know, came from all sorts of different backgrounds. So we are very diverse within ourselves. I think where we get in trouble is when there's one dominant narrative that runs through the church, the leadership, the power, and um, you don't have room. Um, it's really hard to make room in your machine to allow for different voices. So if we implement kind of um, these practices of listening to one another and valuing each other at, you know, even at the cost of like slowing us down. Um, I think when you practice those intercultural ministries, it becomes therefore like an instilled thing and it becomes easier to then accept like people who we see as others or minority groups or other groups. Um, so it's sort of like instilling like this philosophy so that we can in general live that way um, outside of, outside of like in the outside world. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I think that's really important to, you know, I think I, I, one of the things you said there, like at the risk of slowing us down, I think that's so often that um, I want to bring the people who are the most like me, in, if I'm in charge, like I want to bring the people who are most like me into the inner circle because I most like can predict how they'll do things and like, you know, because we have that similarity and it, it's different when you bring in people from a different uh, yeah, culture or a different kind of background or whatever it might be. Uh, and, but that's important and way more important than what you think is efficiency. Yes, definitely. Mm. Yeah, cool. Thank you for that. Uh, so, um, as I mentioned in the intro, you're uh, the creative director of Willow Church in Chicago. Uh, often when I think about the work of intercultural, uh, you know, ministry or work being done, you know, you think about maybe like books or talks or, you know, how do we, you know, share the, you know, who's doing the sermon kind of thing, things like that. Uh, and they're great and they're creative in their own way. Uh, but maybe they're all creative in a similar way. Uh, so how have you found the work of intercultural ministry enhanced through creative, expressive outlets? Uh, perhaps put another way, what can be accomplished through creative expression that might not be achieved through more literal modes? Yeah, I think I learned the answer to this question best in my last ministry setting where uh, we had a, a Pop, uh, like a handful, but a significant population of people that had uh, um, disabilities. 
Um, so there are a lot of people that could not read and there are a lot of people that couldn't handle sitting in a, in a service, sitting for a huge quantities of time or that had like attention problems. Um, so when we were thinking about kind of like centering their voice or bringing like their, what is able to speak to them, um, you know, um, sometimes having a really um, theological and information heavy sermon goes straight, you know, <laughs> goes way above like their head because the learning is different. The way of learning is different. So when you're providing different modes of learning, you may be a visual learner, you may be more um, auditory, you may be a linear thinker, you may be a circular thinker. So when you bring in more arts and different creative modes of expression, you're giving diversity um, and a diversity of learning methods of the gospel. And I think that that really enhances and enriches other people. It really does play into the intercultural ministry aspect because you're really giving voice to those who are not linear thinkers. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So one of the examples that I give in the book in, in the chapter is what we ended up doing is um, we had a meeting, a round table meeting with a lot of members of that community, just asking them, you know, what speaks to them, what kinds of things do they wanna see? And um, for them, you know, if we're gonna have a sermon, um, because a lot of people like sermons and do learn that way, they really enjoy like deep dive, deep, uh, deep dive into the word. So we provided fidgets or things that people can have in their hands or coloring pages so they can pay attention and actually sit through service. Um, for some people, the music was too wordy, right? So choosing really, really simple songs with simple words that have repetitive phrases allowed our uh, non-readers to really um, take part in the songs and really sing the songs. Um, so examples like that, you know, it just gives another, uh, the other, a chance to really participate in community. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, I really appreciate that, that as an example. Um, keep that in mind. Uh, on your website, um, you have three words featured on your kind of banner photo of worship, reconciliation, and identity. Uh, and we'll shout out the website at the end uh, so everyone can go check it out. Um, this semester at our groups, we've been focusing on reconciliation. We've got a few different guests on and we're talking about that as a concept. So what drew you or, or, or continues to draw you to the work of reconciliation and how do you feel it, uh, it intersects with ideas of, of worship and identity? Yeah, this is kind of how I started out in my ministry actually. Mm -hmm. So um, I was a music therapist for a while and then I decided to take a break after I had my first child and uh, during that time, I was really trying to figure out what to do next. And I got a call from the Center for Reconciliation at Duke um, Seminary, Duke uh, Divinity School, sorry. And they invited me to lead worship at their annual Summer Institute for Reconciliation. So what this does, is a full week, and every day they concentrate on a different um, theological element of reconciliation. So imagine a full day dedicated to the practice of lament. You know, I mean, that's a lot, <laughs> a full day, um, a full day to like hope, a full day to new creation. And so I was tasked to kind of like um, build worship around these themes. And what was really cool about that experience was I think everybody realized by the end of the week that worship was really uh, important to the content of reconciliation. It provides a tool for transformation. It provides expression um, around the work of reconciliation. And it, the work itself of worship is reconciliation it's a reconciliatory practice and so um so yeah that's that's kind of how I started out and then I became really passionate about it and that's how we formed our band because we kept getting called out to do different conferences and retreats and events and so um I became really passionate about it so I kind of blog and write around those themes and the identity piece kind of uh goes in line with my book chapter which is when you actually get into a room of people that are so different from you, how do you interact with one another and how are you fully present? 
Um, and that for me was really important to highlight as well. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. That's a great little tie in because um, a lot of our interviews this series are people who are presenting at this year's Duke Summit Institute of Reconciliation. Uh, oh, seriously? Yeah, yeah. That's how we're kind of like building um, uh, this reconciliation thing. We're talking to a bunch who are going to be there this year. So there you go. We've been plugging away that Summer Institute and here was a little like sneaky one halfway through an interview. So that'll like really help nail it down for people. So <laughs> thank you for that. It's a great conference. I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really, really, really intense, but I highly recommend I, I think it's theologically really, really deep, and it doesn't e it doesn't even touch on like race specifically. It you know it ties into the land, it ties into people. I mean, it it covers. It's very comprehensive, so I highly recommend it. Yeah, people should check that out. Definitely, just Google it, and you'll find it. It's really easy. Uh, so, worship space and time is often uh, the most hotly contested topic within a church. Uh, as you said even before, some people just really want sermons or they really want a certain type of song uh, or maybe have a certain picture of, you know, how the church needs to be configured and, and where their seat is. Uh, you know, so, you know, there's often an interesting dynamic when you start to want to introduce change or introduce um, th uh, something new into that space. Yet from your work, it seems like it's a powerful time, a powerful space to use that intercultural engagement, to use for reconciliation, to use to, to help find how one's identity intersects with the other. So how do you recommend others, or how have you in the past, navigated this contested space, this contested time, and, and the varying interests and, and, and feelings wrapped up in it? Change is hard. And um, it, it is a very, um, to become more of a follower of Christ and to become more radical in, in Jesus's ways, we are called to like really die to ourselves and our old ways. And it's a constant conversion. It's a constant transformation. Um, I think sometimes um, a common mistake is kind of like once you believe, that's kind of it. And um, when we are constantly transfer transforming, we go deeper, and that causes us to give up more of ourselves and lift it up to God um, to, to do the Lord's work. And that's a tough death, and I don't want to minimize it. People that want change, that want those things, they're ready for it. Um, but I think we minimize too often what change really means it there's a lot of anxiety attached to change there's a lot of emotions there's a lot of history there and you want to really honor um all of those things um so it you know valuing each other honoring each other that's one piece when when people feel like you understand them um and that you value them and what they they are about i feel like they're much more willing to listen on the other hand, you still have to steer the ship and still move things forward and um, create a community, kind of like cultivate a community that is, um, that is all about change. So instead of having an environment in a church where people are comfortable um, and it's about a safe space, um, I mean, being a Christian is not safe. You know, and I think um, we kind of overlook that. So kind of um, teaching in discipleship that it is a constant changing and a transformation and metamorphosis. I think um, it will create that kind of culture. Um, but yeah, change is really, really hard. Be super patient. And I think the solutions, you kind of have a lot of discussion together and drive it forward but make sure that people are on board with you that they know exactly your process that they know what you're thinking that you're not just some sort of like young person who's going to go in there and like scrap everything um because it doesn't really honor or value th the people that are there and the work that was done in the past mm. so you want to honor that give it some time and then move forward um with a lot of conversation and just be super patient and very prayerful mm. That's great. Yeah, I appreciate it. That's good, good advice to be taking forward. 
So you've recently uh, made a big shift in your ministry, which uh, you documented uh, some of the changes on your website. So like a few of them were like you went from part-time to full-time, staff of three to staff of 15, small church, big church. Like, and, they, and they're like, as I said, like maybe the most, um, the least complicated of the changes, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. So uh, how have you found this process of, of transitioning and, and, you know, and expanding in, I guess, scope to some extent? And, and what have been your big takeaways so far? Man, um, the, yeah, the, uh, um, okay. So the, the transition, I think personally, it has taught me how, how resistant to change I am and how anxious I was to change. And so I feel like God was really teaching me a lot of lessons, still teaching me so many lessons about like new ways, old ways, and um, being grateful. I think for a long time, I was just, um, I mean, I'm really depressed actually about the changes that were happening and accepting my new reality, but turning that into being um, really grateful for the adventures that lie ahead and that sort of shift in thinking. So I feel like that's been very transformational. Um, the transfer, the, um, the transition in work settings, uh, continues to fascinate me. I've never been in this <laughs> setting before. I'm learning so much. I, oh man, I feel like I'm, I'm becoming more well-rounded in the things that I'm doing in my ministry. Mm -hmm. I'm so very, very grateful. Sometimes I'm a little concerned, like, is this what I need to be doing? But overall, learning so much about this new culture and all the changes that it brings. So, um, a lot of of (laughs) chances. That's all. It's good. It's good. You sound like you're taking it in your stride. Um, (laughs) I didn't want this to sound like a performance review. Like, so how are you like going along? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, staying with this, this move within uh, the church. So for some of us in maybe uh, a lot of our listeners are probably in more, uh, you know, maybe progressive mainline churches, older denominations, smaller kind of churches generally. Uh, yeah. There can sometimes be suspicion or, let's say, worse, uh, leveled at, at, at big or mega churches. No, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you've never encountered or heard of any yeah, of that. Never. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, the break the, the bubble, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm sure a lot of that just comes from, like, lack of knowledge, lack of direct experience. Um, like, even here in Australia, there aren't really any mega churches just because our population isn't big enough to kind of, like, sustain it. Um, like, I mean, Hillsong's big, but not compared to... Um, like no actual one meeting of it is anywhere near compared to others. I know that are in the States and elsewhere in the world. So um, what has been your experience uh, going to one of the largest non-denominational churches in the world? Uh, and how do you respond to some of those prejudices and stereotypes that people can hold toward this uh, yeah. mega church kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's almost like it's, it's a completely different way of experiencing church. I mean, it is. It is a completely different way of experiencing church. Uh, This is the first time that I've been in a mega church, non-denominational, evangelical setting. Um, I've been in PC in the Presbyterian USA church and the United Methodist church before. And um, I had a brief stint in the Southern, in the Southern Baptist church which is also very interesting. Um, But this is my first like non-denominational straight up work experience. And, um, you know, I came into it kind of really suspicious. Um, But I will say, here are some highlights. I'm going to give you some highlights. It's been a while since I've worked with non-Christians that are completely new to faith. I think in the mainline churches, I was mostly working with... um, people that were already Christian believers and just in, uh, getting into, disi- into discipleship. So I was able to reach a theological and practicing depth that I'm not able to do here because I'm working with non-Christians. But the thing is I'm working with non-Christians. So that's kind of exciting. Um, second, working in this big, huge, um, kind of machine of a church. Um, they're able to do things like bring in, world-class speakers that talk about leadership development and self-awareness and self-development 
And I wish that smaller churches would take the time um, to talk about organizational structure. I think it could be so helpful um, to even understand how we work together. You as a, your Myers-Briggs or Enneagram or leaders, like your spiritual giftings and how I work like with you, with my giftings and how I'm structured. Um, I mean, so much time and attention is dedicated to that here. And I've learned so much about myself and how I work with others. And um, just, yeah, I, I would say the biggest thing is organizational structure and learning and leadership development. Those have been really, really, really strong. Um, I do miss the very organic nature of smaller churches where er anybody and everybody can kind of like go up there with their gifts and um, or what they feel that they're gifted and are passionate about and offer that as an offering. Um, in the mega church setting, in, in the larger church setting, there are things like quality control because people will just be coming at you all day wanting to um, be seen and heard and known for a lot of wrong reasons. So you kind of have to be very good about filtering down um, to have quality in both um, spiritual realm as well as performance. Um, so now I have like entire conversations about like lights and uh, you know, we're, we all have headsets. We're running around with headsets. Um, that's a whole new ball game. Um, so there, there are kind of things I'm learning now that I wasn't able to really learn in a smaller church setting. And I really, I don't know. I feel it's very, very interesting. It's all very interesting. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's right. Oh, sorry. Uh, what I meant to say is, but completely different experiences and ways of doing ministry. So. Mm. Yeah. And I guess like, you know, also like just with the expanded, uh, you know, resources and expanded amount of people, it also just expands the ability to be involved in the local community or the ability to do different things, uh, you know, enhanced and expanded and, and the ability to do intercultural stuff because it's going to be more likely with more people, more cultures, more uh, ethnicities, more race, more whatever represented uh, yeah. in the church. Yeah. Especially downtown. Chicago. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, great. Uh, okay, so uh, a final question here. Um, if you could just provide one challenge or something like that to church members or church leaders listening to this on the theme of either intercultural ministry or reconciliation, uh, what would it be? What's, what's your parting challenge to us today? A challenge. Um, I would really uh, challenge people to um, understand the, the importance of cultural humility. So cultural, cultural competence means that you kind of achieve some sort of level of knowledge and that everything is good and fine and we're fine now. But cultural humility is always in a posture of learning and growing and expanding your experience of different people in your, in your life and in the world. And uh, having that posture is, is very important. So cultural humility and that humility posture is very important. Um, the second is patience, lots of patience, lots of time. Look at it as a long-term journey instead of something to be achieved. Because um, if you're thinking about just achieving numbers or percentages, it's, it, um, you're kind of missing the mark. And the third, I think, is um, work together in community, always skewing to people that are marginalized, kind of, you know, just the way that Jesus did it, you know, just giving voice to the marginalized and um, bringing light. And then the fourth and final thing is just lots and lots of prayer, just always be listening to what the Lord wants you to do through your ministry. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Oh, well, thank you so much. Yeah. 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 She, she didn't want to give us like an easy challenge. No, it's, um, uh, we really appreciate that. Angie, how can people uh, support you connect with you? Um, yeah. Online or otherwise. Yeah. I'm on all social media platforms as Angie K Hong, A N G I E K A Y H O N G. Um, I have a few kind of really cool projects coming soon. Um, and I, uh, I blog at Christianity Today as well. And um, yeah, check out the book. And yeah, just be on the lookout. <laughs>
lots of cool things coming your way. Awesome. And the website is also angiekhong.com as well. So check that out. You can hear some of the things we've talked about, but yeah, good follow, get on board. And uh, Angie, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, all the best as you, you know, keep going into this new venture over there in Chicago. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, everyone, we look forward to seeing you uh, around the traps and uh, light up the comment section. And uh, yeah, we'll keep the conversation going. Thanks, everyone.